Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Metaphysics Book 1, Aristotle will make a fundamental distinction between two different modalities of having knowledge or know-how, if you like, one of which he calls experience, or in Greek, empiria. This is something that's quite familiar to all of us with uh, many of the things that we, we do on a daily basis that we have experience of. And then the other would be something more rigorous, something that's in a certain way more worthy of being called knowledge. And he uses two different terms here. That he, he does know are different from each other, art or techne, and science or episteme. Now, he, he tells you later on in the metaphysics that he's covered these in the Nicomachean Ethics, and we don't need to go into the discussion here. They're really being used for the purposes of this discussion as synonyms for each other. What's most important is how they're distinguished from experience. Before we get there, he starts out by talking about animals. And we are animals, so that's also where we should begin. We get to know the world in part through the senses, through having sensation or perception, aesthesis. This is a term that, that Aristotle uses quite frequently. And we're never totally disconnected from that, at least in most of our concerns. And then he talks about animals as also living by impressions or appearances, phantasiae. These are things that they, they perceive coming in from the world around them. And some animals may not have very many senses at all. Some of them may have the full panoply that we do. But Aristotle thinks that animals other than us are not quite as developed in how they use these things. Only certain animals have the capacity for what he terms memory, mneme. And this is very important because memory is what allows us to identify similar instances as similar instances and not just go by instinct in a sort of stimulus response way, but to learn from our environment and our engagements with it. Perhaps even to have something like passing pseudo or, or proto knowledge down at the level of animals. He doesn't say that animals are totally disconnected from what he's calling experience here. As a matter of fact, he holds out the possibility that some of them do participate in that, but they don't to the degree that human beings do. And from, he says, many memories of something arises this distinctive way of being able to approach things in the world and situations and other persons and ourselves that he calls experience. Imperia. This is a sort of know-how or knack or ability to figure things out without truly knowing these matters in a universal sense, as we're going to talk about, without being able to provide a theoretical account of them. So, you know, what would be examples of this? Think about when you ride a, a bicycle or a skateboard or any other wheeled thing. Did you study a book that, I mean, you may have, maybe you watched YouTube videos with a step-by-step -step tutorial. On, well, first you have to, you know, put your feet in this way and you're doing that for this reason because these principles are involved. 
I don't know. That's not how I learned to ride a bike. I watched other people do it. And then I got my butt on the seat and put my, my feet on the pedals. And at first it had training wheels. So I get used to the balancing, right? And then after a while of going around and around with the bike, they took my training wheels off and I started riding the bike and I was very proud. And now I knew how to ride a bike. And riding a bike is a great example because we use it in English as a sort of a proverb. You know, you, it's just like riding a bike. You, you've learned how to do it once. You may not have done it for a while. You can start to do it again. We'll come back to examples like that in, in a moment. But in any case, we have all sorts of things that we learn from experience. Then we human beings have the possibility of something that Aristotle doesn't think animals participate in at all. And he says, he doesn't explain it here, but he says that we human beings live not only by appearances or memories or those sorts of things, but also by art and by reasoning, logismos in, in the Greek, which is not the same thing as logos, but it means sort of the instances of using logos, this capacity for speech or, or reason that is so distinctively human. We live by that. We develop ourselves by that. That leads us to the possibility of art or science. These systematic, accumulative disciplines that a person can have as a disposition. You know, when we say that somebody has studied something, we could mean that they've acquired some experience just sort of, you know, watching things and experimenting. Or we could mean that they've actually learned the principles of it in some sort of systematic, well laid out way. And, and you know, these are relative terms. We're not saying that anybody acquires art or science to the absolute highest degree and knows everything that there is to know about everything because these grow by increments. Arts and sciences, we add to them over time. And every once in a while, we discover that things that we thought were correct are actually incorrect. I'll give you a prime example of that. I learned from my physician that um, what we were taught when I was a young boy and then a young man about exercise and stretching, uh, according to modern exercise science, is incorrect. Instead of stretching a lot before exercising, you should stretch after it. Uh, you do want to limber yourself up before doing exercise, but the stretching turns out to be counterproductive. Who knew, right? That's an example of revision within the arts and sciences. And Aristotle doesn't talk about that here, but it fits his model quite well. So what's the fundamental set of differences between experience on the one hand and art or science on the other hand? Aristotle frames this in terms of what it is that we actually do know and what we can do with it. So he tells us that the person who has experience has knowledge, but not of the overarching generalities. They understand particulars and they understand them quite well. So they understand the kath hekaston, the, you might say, in accordance with or, or looking down on each thing. Hekastos uh, is, is, you know, each, right? And so if I know how to fish, because I, I used to go fishing with my father and I understand how to fish well for bluegill and smallmouth bass and um, perch, which I do. In fact, I learned that from doing it with my father as well as white bass. Um, that doesn't mean that I actually know about fishing as an art or science per se, it means that I know about how to fish for these kind of fish. And I may actually be an advantage here in the Midwest where these are the kinds of fish that, you know, we often do go for. I, I actually don't know how to fish well for crappie or for Northern pike because we, we didn't do that, but I could consult a book perhaps or somebody who knows and learn those sorts of things. I suppose I could watch a YouTube video as well. But this is knowledge of particulars. And knowledge of particulars can be quite effective as we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. What about over on this side? Here it's knowledge of the universals, the katholu in Greek, meaning 
the knowledge no longer just of the each instance or the separate classes of things, but of the universal, the general, the everything. So this is a different kind of knowledge. This really is more knowledge than this is. This is more know-how or being able to recognize, identify things in particular areas and circumstances. This understands in a different way. And we'll come back to the effectiveness thing in a moment. I want to follow this out. Aristotle says that um, this person knows the that. They know the tohoti. That something is the case. So they know, for example, that in this kind of circumstance, um, you, you should feed a person this kind of food if you want to have this kind of effect. But they can't tell you why. They don't actually know the causes. They don't understand, as Aristotle says, the wherefore, the dehoti, right? They understand the hoti, but they don't understand the through what. And they don't know the cause. They don't know the aitia in Greek, the reason why things are the way they are. We could come up with all sorts of examples. Let's take the fishing one, for for example. So, you know, my dad, who wasn't uh, prone to explaining too much when it came to fishing, he would always tell me the line of, the fish can hear you. So, you know, let's all be really quiet. Uh, I think in part because he wanted to have some peace and quiet while we were sitting in the boat. I would sometimes ask him, as I did, as, you know, a curious kid, all sorts of questions about why we're using this bait or why we're doing things this way. And, you know, I don't know if he actually had answers or not, but he didn't give me any answers. So the best that he passed on to me was in Padria. You want to fish for white bass in, in these sort of circumstances? Let's use some wax worms or some helgramites, right? <laughs> worms maybe won't do it. If we're going for bluegill, maybe we do bobber fishing. Why? I don't know, because I never learned the art or science of, of fishing in that case. I didn't learn the cause or the wherefore. And we could come up with all sorts of examples of this. Think about cooking for uh, a set of instances. There's many people who are quite good at cooking. They know how to make meals. They know how to make particular dishes. But they couldn't tell you why the dish actually tastes good or why there should be this amount of this kind of spice or why add vinegar at this point. Whereas if we're talking about, you know, um, a scientific approach to the culinary arts, you might say, well, you know, we have these different tastes and adding vinegar to the dish uh, at this point or lemon juice makes the, the other tastes come out better. It adds a certain sourness, which balances the saltiness or the sweetness. Or you cook for this long, and the reason why you brown the meat is to get this chemical reaction take place, right? And, and we also know some very interesting things. For example, um, when again, I'll give you one from my childhood. My father would marinate meat, and the stuff that he cooked was quite good. But what the you know, test kitchen people tell us is that marinades really don't do much of anything. They don't penetrate steak uh, very far and you're better off just doing other things instead. Who knew again, right? They knew because they used art or science to figure it out. And I would have passed down that information about marinades to my children and taught them the same thing that my dad was doing. And it would have been wrong. Now, we can say, however, that in many cases, experience could be dead on. That's part of why we follow it in, in a lot of cases. And we don't actually go and acquire scientific knowledge or, or technical skill uh, about everything. Instead, we do rely on experience because the person who is well experienced, as Aristotle says, is quite often more effective in practical manners. So he uses the example, uh, which is you know something he knew very intimately, of medicine. His father was actually a physician. He tells us that a physician who doesn't actually have art or science, but is just sort of, you know, think about a field medic, for example, somebody who learned how to take care of wounded people, how to deal with certain kinds of common ailments or diseases. Um, they, they, they often can be very, very effective because they understand the particulars 
far better than the person who merely understands the universal. So the person who understands the universal may not actually know if they're rather green or inexperienced when to make exceptions to those universal rules or how to even evaluate how to diagnose a particular case in front of them, like Socrates with having some foot issues, you know, what, what should we prescribe as he's on the march? It may be that the experienced person has a better understanding of that for the time being than the person who is using art or science. There's nothing to say that you can't combine the two, however. The last thing that we want to focus on here is that the person who has art or science, Aristotle says, actually has knowledge more than the experienced person does. They also are closer to wisdom than the experienced person. And one sign of this is that they can teach other people. Now, you might say, well, wait a second. Didn't your dad teach you how to fish or how to marinate meat or any of those sorts of things? Didn't you uh, learn how to play soccer by, you know, actually getting out there and, and playing on the field and the coach making you do certain things? And we could go on and on. So Aristotle must have something different in mind than merely acquiring this kind of skill when he talks about teaching. He must mean something like teaching by means of explaining what the causes or general principles are so that the, the other person isn't just able to produce certain results, but they understand why those results are produced, why they are effects of those causes. That's the kind of teaching that he's talking about. The very last thing that I'll mention is, is Aristotle establishes a kind of hierarchy. So the person with art or science knows more, is closer to wisdom than the person who merely has experience. But we can also talk about people having arts or sciences that are subordinated to each other. He uses a term architectone. It's the word that we get architect from. And in an old fashioned sense, the architect is not just somebody who drew up you know, blueprints and then said, hey, go at it, make the house or something like that, you know, create the building. The architect oversaw the entire process of building the building and in overseeing it, the architect, the architectone, the ruling technical person is ruling over all of the other technical people who have their subsidiary arts or sciences. So we could think of other things as being architectonic in that sense. Plato, or Aristotle rather, will talk about political science in the ethics as being architectone in that way because it decides what all the other arts and sciences within the city do and what their points and purposes and priorities are. So Aristotle thinks that whoever is the architectone, the person who has the ruling ardor skill, they are closer to wisdom than the person who merely has the subsidiary art or science. But both of them are further along on the way to wisdom than the person who merely has experience.